Have you ever wondered what it was like to be a peasant in the Middle Ages? In this video, we'll look at the reality for most of the population in the medieval era. It was a period of great change and religious piety for many, especially for the nobility, royals and clergy of Western Europe and beyond. But what about everyone else? What was it really like? For most poor people, they were at the bottom of the feudal system. They made up most of the population, who were largely agricultural labourers, peasants. Peasants were divided up into three social levels, slaves, serfs and tenant farmers. Life was hard and short, and for those who were peasants it was also repetitive. Everyday life revolved around farming through all weathers, attending church and possibly avoiding the plague. Sometimes a free man might have to become a serf if his crops or lands were impacted by war, drought or criminal acts, he might have no choice but to submit himself to a local lord or baron. In exchange for protection, the freeman would have to agree to pay in labour, cash, food, military aid or a combination of these. To give up being a freeman impacted the children of the family too, as they inherited their status from their father and so would be considered serfs from birth. Freemen were a very small percentage of the population in medieval Europe, but those who were free tenants could rent their lands with little or no service to the local lord. Villains were a common form of serf, especially in northern Europe, and would be considered slightly higher in social standing than the lowest serfs. The service they provided to their lords would most likely include farming some of their lords' lands, usually required seasonally, such as at harvest time. This might include ploughing, fixing fences, tending to livestock or even working in the manor itself. The rest of their time would be spent farming their own small patch of land to grow food to eat or feed to livestock. Anything left over from this they were able to sell. But the main problem a peasant had was that the tasks required on their lord's lands would be the same on their own. When wheat was ready on the lord's demesnes, it was ready on their land too. This work would mostly be carried out by men, while women remained at home to do domestic work such as weaving and spinning. However, at certain times of year, such as at harvest time, all members of a family would be expected to join in with working on the land. Unlike a free tenant, they were unable to simply move away when they wanted to work for a new lord or baron, as they were tied to the land they rented. In return for this, however, the peasants would receive defence from the lord if they were attacked, food through times of crop difficulty, and guarantee on their land tenure. Peasants had to pay rent to a lord for the land they had. And on top of this, they had to pay a tithe to the church. This was a tax that would be a tenth of whatever they grew or sold. And if they didn't have enough, they had to pay with seeds or farming equipment, which would make it a lot more difficult the following year. These weren't the only taxes. Some peasants also had to pay to get married if they were serfs. This was known as merchet and was paid by a prospective husband, father or brother. This practice was thought to have started up to make up for the loss of a worker. There were taxes to pay when a family member died in order to retain the rights to their lands, taxes to protect against corporal punishment and fines for having a child outside of wedlock. A peasant would probably have lived in a small house on their rented land. The conditions inside would probably be pretty poor. The house would probably just be one or two rooms the floor would be made from earth and there would be little to no windows for ventilation and light. There also would have been a fire on fairly constantly to cook on and heat water, which would have filled the room with smoke and made it uncomfortably hot in the summer. It was also common for medieval families to keep their livestock inside when needed, as at times animals would need shelter or warmth and it was the only building available. However, conditions improved over time, 
and eventually two rooms became more common, even sometimes a second floor being added. Within a household, peasants would most likely have been made up of husband and wife, children, grandparents and other relatives who helped with their work. In urban areas, merchants and artisans would take young children, usually boys, on as apprentices and they would become part of their master's family. But the wealthier peasant families might also take on servants, especially in rural dwellings. These were usually girls who took on domestic service work. In the early Middle Ages, both men and women married sometime in their early 20s, usually due to there being little land available for cultivation. Getting married would increase your land. But this later changed as peasants were able to gain more land and girls would often be married in their teens. But men would still marry later due to needing to gain money and resources to raise a family. Even more peasants' war wouldn't have been pleasant. Clothes would be made from coarse materials such as wool or hemp. Poor people wouldn't be able to afford the wonderful colours that wealthy people dyed their garments with either, so they would have been quite drab looking. Working in all weathers, all year round, meant that peasant clothes were simple and usually consisted of a basic tunic. In winter, men might have worn trousers, and in summer they would wear shorter breeches, or possibly later in the medieval era, hose. Women would have worn a longer tunic of the same materials and likely a cap to cover their heads. Later in the medieval period, peasants might wear a capuchon, a tightly fitted hood which extended down onto the shoulders, or a small round cap that could be tied under the chin to keep it on. They also might have worn a sleeveless woolen tunic attached by brooches at the shoulders in the earlier medieval period. But where did the cloth come from for these clothes? Some wealthier peasants might have bought a few things from traders, but it's most likely their wardrobe came from inside the home. Married women were expected to stay home, and weaving and creating cloth for clothes was one of their most important tasks. They would use a spinning wheel and loom in the main room of the house, and it's knowledge that would have been handed down to daughters. Clothes also didn't come with pockets yet, so peasants would carry the little cash they had in a purse or pouch made from leather or cloth. Both men and women wore tough shoes made from animal skins or leather, or even boots in wetter, colder weather if they had a little more money. Shoes would have been repaired many times over instead of being thrown away, but the poorest peasants would probably have had nothing at all on their feet or legs. Ironically, the Black Death that killed much of the population in 1346 had a surprising benefit for those who survived it. As there were less peasants to compete for jobs, they were able to command higher wages. This led to them buying better fabrics for clothes, and the rich establishment panicked that the peasants were getting a bit uppity, buying similar cloth as they wore. This led to Edward III in the 14th century, passing laws to prevent poorer people from wearing certain fabrics and types of clothing, and later rulers added to these. Only very wealthy people were able to wear furs, cloth of gold or silver, and silk. Most of the population, the peasants, would have only been able to wear coarse linen and the worst quality of wool, with no extra decoration. However, if you were a wealthier peasant, for example a skilled craftsman, you might be allowed slightly better cloth or buttons, but not over a certain value of money. So now that we know what peasants would have looked like and where they might have lived, what did they eat? You might be surprised to learn that peasants actually had quite a varied and interesting diet. They were no different to us in that they would get bored of eating the same thing every day. However, bread was the staple food on the table. While brown or wholemeal bread is today seen as much healthier for us, it was seen as peasant's bread due to how much less refining went into creating the flour for it, and rich folks ate white bread. Most peasants ate a very dark bread made from rye grain. Although meat was something mostly served on the tables of the wealthy, 
Peasants might eat stews made from beef, mutton, pork or vegetables. Meat generally was for special occasions, such as religious holidays and feast days, much like how people might only have turkey at Christmas or Thanksgiving nowadays. Peasants who lived near the coast or lakes might be able to do some fishing if the local lord permitted it, and this would generally be smoked, salted or dried in order to keep it fresh for as long as possible. Fish could range from easy to fish varieties like freshwater pike, cod, perch and trout, and more exotic fish such as porpoises and whale might be sold in urban centres. Whale would be served in large slices, but one writer from the 16th century stated that it was hard and indigestible even after 24 hours cooking. It doesn't sound very tasty, but those who lived in coastal areas could enjoy fresh fish as well, which might consist of herring or mackerel. A very common dish was pottage, a type of stew made in a pot. This would mostly be made up of foraged ingredients such as mushrooms, root vegetables and herbs, or it might also be things grown in a small garden. It would be cooked slowly over a fire and was probably very healthy as it would be made mostly of vegetables. Some of the foraged herbs would be made into sauces for fish or stews, especially sorrel, which was a really popular herb of the medieval period. They would even be able to make their own cheese if they reared some cows, and they would have eggs if they kept a few chickens. If they wanted to risk the severe punishments of poaching, a peasant might even attempt to catch some rabbits. But it wasn't just savoury food they created, peasants could make desserts too. While the wealthy might use sauces made from almonds, peasants would stick to honey, which was cheaper and easier to get hold of. It was even possible for them to make sweets in the form of candied peel. Recipes explained how this could be done by layering orange peel with honey and cooking in a pot until the honey crystallised, then adding ginger. They would also have foraged wild berries and nuts. Of course, medieval peasants also needed something to drink, and their beverage of choice might be ale. It was less prone to contamination than water, especially in urban areas, but ale also offered lots of extra calories for a population that would burn off a lot of energy through labouring. They would mix grains, malt and water and leave it to ferment over the course of a day. Even children could drink this concoction, but it would have a much lower alcohol content than ale we drink today. However, where it was clean and safe, such as in rural areas, many people still drank water. There were times everyone, both nobles and serfs, would not have eaten many of these foods. Throughout most of Europe in this period, Fridays would have been a fasting day, along with other festivals such as Lent and Advent. This meant meat and other animal products such as milk, cheese, eggs and butter would not have been permitted, but it was considered okay to eat fish. Possibly the reason that Fridays in the UK are still considered a day for buying fish and chips. The structure of when peasants ate during the day was different to many of us as well, as they would commonly only eat two meals a day, a bigger meal at lunchtime and a lighter meal in the evening. Having said that, it was also common for labouring people to eat a breakfast of some kind as they would burn a lot of energy off during their working day. Snacks were also common, although frowned upon by the church, and eating breakfast was frowned upon if it broke the overnight fast too early. But the weirdest part of the medieval diet was its strict adherence to medical advice of the day, but not like we have now. At the time, medical science was dominated by the four bodily humours theory proposed by Gallen, which suggested that human health was balanced between phlegm, blood, yellow bile and black bile. This led to some strange combinations for food that we would probably not enjoy today. Speaking of which, if peasants got ill, they were very limited in their choice of medication. Their first port of call would have been their own cupboard stores, in the form of herbs. Herbs would have been grown not only for flavour, 
but also for any medicinal purposes they may have had. It's also possible they would have been able to enlist the services of a local woman who could assist with childbirth or less severe illness, but it's unlikely most poor people would have been able to afford the services of a doctor. If they were seriously ill, they might have been able to go to an early form of hospital, a monastic hospital. These were open to the poor, old and pilgrims and would have offered physical as well as spiritual relief. But the lifespan of a peasant could be cut short. Plagues and diseases ran rampant at a time when no one understood about germs or bacteria and the close cramped conditions for poor people who lived in urban areas helped spread these faster. While it took longer to reach them, of course, the majority of the population living in rural areas were also not free from the reach of these illnesses. The Black Death, the most famous episode of the bubonic plague in Europe, would go on to decimate the population of North Africa, Asia and Europe by an estimated 75 to 200 million. There were also very high rates of infant mortality and half of all children died before their fifth birthday. However, if you managed to make it past your teen years, avoided dying in childbirth or catching the plague, there was a good chance a peasant could live to their 60s or 70s, not too different from an expected lifespan in the 20th century. So, if you managed to avoid dying of the plague, dressing in the wrong clothes and working all day until sunset, was there any chance for entertainment? The good news is that there were opportunities for something to break up the monotony of everyday life. Some things we would recognise in our own time, and many others would leave us with horror. There were plenty of cruel amusements, such as bear baiting, cock fighting, and watching the latest execution in the centre of town. But peasants could also entertain themselves by telling stories, playing music or singing and dancing. Actors might travel around the country performing mystery plays. These were not just entertainment, but also had a religious moral, ensuring people remembered to behave themselves. Church itself could be counted as a social event, and was possibly where people might meet up for a gossip at the back of the church pews. At the end of harvest, apple bobbing was a popular activity, which was born from a mixture of Roman and pagan festivals, remaining into the medieval period and now, especially at Halloween. Unmarried young men and women of the village would try to be the first to bite an apple and they would be the next to get married, or some variations had the name of the unmarried men of the village carved on them. Mob football was also popular, but very different from the modern day game. Hundreds of villagers or townsfolk might take part in two teams, but the goals would be several miles apart, usually at opposite ends of the village, and there were no rules. You could kick, punch and otherwise prevent your opponent from taking the ball from your team in any way you liked. This probably led to many injuries, and probably some deaths. It was so popular and violent that both English and French kings tried to ban it, as they believed it took up time that could be better spent, such as on practicing archery. Another game medieval peasants loved to take part in was water jousting. While most serfs wouldn't have got anywhere near a horse and set of armor, they were happy to create their own version of the aristocracy's sport on boats. Two teams would be on two long rowboats which would come towards each other, and one teammate at the front of the boat would hold out a long pole to knock over his counterpart. Unlike real jousting, this sport usually didn't end in broken bones and severe injuries, but simply in getting a soaking. And while both were publicly prohibited by the church, gambling and drinking would have been hugely popular pastimes, as people were already able to make their own alcohol, and gambling games could be cheap to create and take part in. There was even a form of bowling that we would recognize today, with nine pins instead of ten, that you had to throw an underarm ball at. So what was the life of a medieval peasant really like? 
Was it all doom and gloom? While it's true that peasants probably spent a large amount of their time labouring and they would have worn rough, uncomfortable clothing inside dark, small and smelly houses, a lot of other things are myths. They ate different food to the nobility, but most of it was healthy and they had a good variety of things to eat, which was supplemented by growing their own herbs. Even though there was high infant death, if you survived into adulthood, you had a good chance of getting to old age. But it's true that medicine was a little rudimentary at this point. But there was at least some entertainment and fun to be had even by those at the bottom of society. But it's unlikely we would want to partake in the cruel blood sports they enjoyed alongside singing and dancing. <laughs>